Guys, a 45 second review of what we did on Thursday. We did some binary, two versions. And so if we had a number like this in base 2, and we wanted to convert that to base 10, the parentheses uh, 10 <clears throat> just means that it's base 10, it's decimal. What's the value of this place? This is the ones place. So what's that one? That's the 2, that's the 4, and the 8, and the 16. And if we were doing real, you know, computers as the, uh, real numbers as the computer understands it, a byte is a collection of 8 bits. And there's nothing totally magical about 8 bits. In the 60s and stuff like that, they designed computers that had, you know, 14-bit groups and, you know, 16-bit groups and whatever. It's just that Intel, in the early, early 70s, when they came out with their microprocessor, chose 8 bits, and it's been a standard ever since, considering Intel's dominance and how everybody, com you know, copied them and stuff like that. And so, if we were going to keep going, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, <clears throat> 6, 7, 8, right? So that would be the 32 place, the 64 place, and the 128. <clears throat> and if it was all ones, you'd just add 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus, you know, all the way down to 1, which would give you 255. So, since you count zero as being a number, that means that one byte can hold up to 256 different possibilities. And we'll see that again at a certain point when we talk about ASCII. So anyways, what we have here is how many ones do we have? Zero. None, but we have a two, and we have a four, and then what else do we have? Sixteen. And if we added those guys together, we'd get 20, 22. So this is equal to... 22 base 10. Hope that makes sense. Who missed the lecture on Thursday? <laughs> Wave your hand if you missed it on Thursday. All right, I'm going to need to post um, a video for y'all, point you to a YouTube video so that you can review this because you don't get to see me writing on the board when you watch the video, right? And so you need some more visual help on it. It's going to be a real short one, like 10 minutes. It'll be optional, you know. To your advantage to do it, though. There'll be a couple questions like that on an exam. I'll probably give you all a worksheet so you, you get, a, get a couple more chances to get the knowledge. But knowing that the front switch controls the back of the one and vice versa, you'd think I'd remember that. So I said that one byte is eight bits. And we showed that one, 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 one in base two equals 255 in base 10, giving us 256 possible values. Now there's a shortcut for figuring out the number of possible values. It's just 2 to the power of the number of bits, right? So 2, 2, star, star, 8, meaning to the power of, is equal to 256. So when you had your uh, old, old, old Nintendos, you know, your 8-bit computers, your Nintendo 64, excuse me, your Commodore 64s and stuff like that, like, you know, y'all had stuff that old that everybody knew, somebody with a Nintendo or whatever. I mean, played with them when you were really young. They could only display a very limited color set, right? They only had a limited amount of RAM that they could access. And as a matter of fact, they didn't... They could pick from like one of 256 colors, but really they had a, the ability to put fewer colors on the screen at the same time. You know, they could display at most like 16 colors on the same 
on the page, on the screen at the same time. And that would be because they had, you know, a four-bit video card, which is capable of, you know, displaying 16 colors at the same time. Limited amount of RAM, and then you bought your Super Nintendo, your Genesis, which had 16 bits. So you had 2 to the power of 16, which is 65536, five, right? Way more RAM, way better video cards, display more colors on the screen, stuff like that. These numbers also had a side effect for how much RAM you could access with the architecture. You know, we had 32-bit processors in our, you know, Windows 7 was a 32-bit operating system and stuff like that. I'm going to have to uh, Google this one up. Anyways, if you look at this one, that's called 64K. In uh, physics and math and stuff like that, a K is exactly equal to 1,000, but a kilobyte in computer is 1024, just because that's a power of 8. Something like that. So, if we divided that by 1024, we would get that that is a 64K. So, the largest that a 16 bit processor, which is what powered the, uh, the Genesis and the uh, Super Nintendo, could access, would be 64 kilobytes of RAM. Nowadays, our watches have, you know, 10,000 times as much as that. So, Windows 32, or Win32, like Windows 7 and stuff like that. Even uh, some versions of uh, Windows 10 can run in, you know, 32-bit systems rather than 64. So if we do 2 to the 32, just to figure out how much RAM they could access, we see this mega huge number. But then that's the number of bits, so we're going to divide that by 8 to get the number of bytes that they can process. And I'm not seeing the number that I was expecting here. I think you it. That, that would make sense, because <laughs> that number got larger rather than small. All right, let's try that one more time. Thanks. So that would be kilobytes, but to get to megabytes, you divide by 1 or 2, 4 again. And then when you wanted to get the kilobytes, these numbers are not going where I was expecting them to go. All right, I've definitely made a good, uh, uh, mistake there. Your 32-bit operating systems could access, like, at most 4 gigabytes of RAM. And, you know, I think Windows hacked it a little bit so that, that uh, you know, you had a couple extra, you know, or the Intel architectures hack, hacked it a little bit. <clears throat> Gigabytes of RAM, right? So your laptops and stuff like that from the, uh, you know, the mid-2000s or whatever rarely came with more than that. But now we have 64-bit operating systems, which is just, you know, unimaginably more, you know, total number of accessible values, right? So if we do 2 to the power of 64, and then we divided that, you know, what? 2 to the power of 64. That would be the number of bits, and then if we wanted to divide, you know, by uh, certain values to get to the number of, uh, you know, megabytes or whatever, it's still a vast number. We're, we're never going to, you know, well, say never. Bill Gates infamously thought that no computer would ever need more than 624, you know, 640 kilobytes. Well, he, he was wrong. So anyways... The uh, numbers that we're looking at <clears throat> have a direct correspondence with the values that the numbers can store. That will matter a little bit more later, but in some early programming languages, you only had 8 bits to store your numbers in, which would be like 256 possible values. Or you had, 60, you had 16 bits in which to store your numbers, in which case you could store between you know, that and that. That's not really enough. A lot of computers nowadays use 2 to the power of 32. They use 32-bit sized integers um, in order to hold their data. And so they can hold up values of about 4 billion. Or plus, or, so, you know, 4 billion different values. <clears throat> if you do any uh, C++ or any Java or programming or whatever, 
you're going to have a data type that can only hold, you know, numbers of up to four billion, and that's a big number, but it wouldn't carry the national debt, right? You know, so then uh, there's a double wide data type that uses 64 bits on the chip, and so it can hold vastly more than four billion. So on those operating systems, excuse me, those uh, programming languages, they are limited in the, you know, or the, the number of bits dictates the kind of data that the uh, variable can hold. Python is a little bit different. They don't care whether it runs on the same architecture or not because, you know, it can run on many different forms, of many different platforms. And so they just said, well, we always want this data type to always be able to hold this number. So if we popped open Python, I'm going to load up idle, and just into the shell, I'm going to, you know, see if I can assign a value, a large value. What if I do A is equal to 8, and then I'm going to go for a billion, so that's nine zeros, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and I hit A to see how big it is. That works. That would not have worked in the C++ or Java language. It's too big to fit in that. I remember I said it would go up to 4 billion. And then if we do A is equal to A, you know, times a thousand, it's still going to work. I don't even know how large a number we could use. How about a squared? That are, you know, this is probably, okay, huge numbers, right? So the guy who invented Python decided not to make it hardware limited at all. That data type just supports, you know, arbitrarily huge numbers. And so that's pretty cool. Back when I said that one byte was equal to eight bits, which held 256 possible values. If you think about it, absolutely everything on a computer is stored as numbers, even text, right? If you want to say dad, bad, like that, each one of those letters has to be converted into a number to be written to the hard drive or to be written to the memory or something like that. And so for that, you use what's called an encoding set. And the one that won, the one that everybody wound up using eventually, was known as ASCII. And we could load up ASCII. I'm going to type in ASCII table. It's, it's going to take me to something called ASCIItable.com, and we get a, a quick peek at what ASCII looks like. So if we had the word dad, or we or bad, and we wanted to store that to the disk. The way you read this is you see this column called character. You look up the typewriter character, the keyboard value, and a B is equal to a 66. So out here, where I had bad, written in the memory is the number 66, followed by an A is a 65, And there's no space between them, right? But that's just uh, conceptually. And then a D would be like two more than a B because it's counting down regularly. And that's a 68. So every time you type in text, like if you said A is equal to bad, behind the scenes it's storing numbers like that. 66, 65, 68, something like that. ASCII stands for American Standard coding for information interchange, something like that. But, you know, obviously it's not just Americans who use it. It uh, is limited, though, because if you look at it, it supports pretty much everything that a, te um, that a typewriter can type, uppercase and lowercase and stuff like that. It uses only 7 bits rather than 8, so it goes all the way up to 127 rather than 255. And then there's the extended ASCII character set, which goes ahead and has it all the way out to 255. Gives you all these drawing characters so that on a, on a terminal like, you know, old-fashioned uh, computer monitor, you know, we could uh, display, you know, boxes and stuff like that. And then also we needed characters. When I say we, I didn't invent this. Right, for umlauts and, you know, diacritical marks and stuff, you know, in German and Spanish and, and stuff like that. Well, that's great and all that, but this would not support, you know, Russian. So the Russians use a different version of ASCII, where the characters past 128 were Russian symbols. You know, and that just totally left the Japanese out, you know, 
in left field because they, you know, they use systems with far more, you know, letters and pictographs and, you know, things like that. Ch Chinese is the same way, Korean is the same way, you know, vast numbers of characters. There's absolutely no way you could store those alphabets and, uh, you know, languages using just 255 bits per character. So they use what's, so what got invented next was something called Unicode, which instead of using 8 bits per character, use 16 bits per character. And so instead of just 255 different possibilities for letters, you know, 255 different keys that it could support, they had 65,000, which is a lot, right? You can, it turns out you can store pretty much any language, you know, under the sun. You just define it. You say, okay, um, I need a new language. I'm going to figure out the letters that are used, you know, in Swahili or whatever. And so then they dedicate a certain number, you know, a certain range for the Swahili characters. And then when the fonts are invented that support that, then everybody can load up Word and use a specific font, and they can type in Swahili. And all the emoticons have specific values now, right? So, you know, you have a, a, a guy waving, but, you know, you have four different shades. You've got the yellow, and then the light skin, and then the dark skin. So that's five different characters out in Unicode. You know, and who knows? Someday they'll put Klingon and Elvish and, you know, all the uh, languages from, uh, you know, um, Game of Thrones and stuff like that. I'm kind of kidding, but so many computer nerds like learning how to speak Klingon that it would not surprise me if it got shoehorned into this. So that's called Unicode, or a double byte character set because it uses two characters per letter rather than one. But the old original ASCII was kind of shoehorned back into the standard. You know, so a number 65, 65 is always an A regardless of whether you're using, you know, a double byte character set or a single byte character set. The editing tools we use, Idle, or we could use Notepad or, you know, TextPad or whatever, still are ASCII editors. They create 8-bit files rather than 16-bit files. And before I go any further in that direction, I'm going to have to start talking about hexadecimal, and I'm not going to. So let's go back to our lecture. And I've been way remiss in actually giving out homework, so I need to take care to direct our lecture in a way that you can get some homework to do. And you're going, oh, rats. But we got to do it. I do not recall going over this well. Pseudocode is a way of describing an algorithm, and an algorithm is just a recipe for solving a problem. Like if you want to convert <clears throat> from Celsius to Fahrenheit, then there's a specific formula that does that. But if you told a programmer that you want a program that converts from Celsius to Fahrenheit, they need a lot more information than just that. You say, oh, go convert Celsius to Fahrenheit. And they toss you a pocket calculator because that's all you need. Now, instead, we would want to describe the, the algorithm, the recipe, which is more than the formula. It's a series of steps that we want to use to solve the problem. So in general terms, before we get to pseudocode, we just want to write it out as a problem, as a description. Ask the user for a temperature in Celsius, convert it to Fahrenheit, and display the result. Right? That's a pure English description. Right? We want to turn that into an algorithm. So we are going to express that as pseudocode. Now, an algorithm can be expressed in any programming language, but pseudocode is kind of a generic thing. It's kind of loosey-goosey, so that it's not a specific programming language. It's just kind of an English description that you could then give to a programmer in any language, and then they can turn it into you know, actual code. So this is not Python code that I'm about to type. And if I try to type it in Python, I'm going to go ahead and do this in idle but I'm going to mark it off with the three uh, quotes that indicate that it's part of a comment. If we try to type in what I'm about to type and run it as a Python program, it will not work. So, why use it? Because it's a way of conceptually planning out what your program is going to do while skipping the details, right? If you told somebody to go to Walmart and you told them, you know, turn left, 
drive half a mile, turn right and stuff like that. That's not really all that's involved, right? You have to control the car, you have to put the, you know, the brakes on, the accelerator, you have to stop at the lights. There's a lot of details that are left out. But since we're smart and we already know how to drive cars and, and follow road signs and stuff like that, we can just say go left, you know, go half a mile, turn right. We can give instructions like that. Well, pseudocode is more like that. It's just the general, dis general descriptions of what we're going to do. So I'm going to type some in. You don't have to type it in. But we're, after this, we're going to, uh, you know, actually do some code. I'd be more interested in y'all typing that in. So I'm going to put a, a code, you know, triple, 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 triple quotes up there. And I would like for y'all, whenever you do homework, to just up at the top put your name, you know, and, and what class this is, maybe the date, and a description of what we're doing. In this case, we're doing pseudocode and Python for conversions. And when I'm up here and I'm typing lickety-split, you kind of leave out the comments. If I'm going too fast, I want you to slow me down. But, you know, sometimes I'll put like a five or a ten line comment explaining what a line of code does. And you don't have to put all that because you just have to understand the concept. And I always upload the notes later. Okay, so quote, 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 I'm going to come up with some pseudocode. Now, as the book shows, the standard for pseudocode, and there's more than one standard for pseudocode, but we're going to try to kind of go with what the book wants, looks like this. Input my number. Set my answer equals my number times two. Output my answer. Now, like I said, if I type this code into Python, it's not going to work. One thing, it doesn't know what a start is. It doesn't know what stop means. There is an input keyword, but this is not the syntax for it at all. The uh, word set means something completely different in the Python programming language, and I don't think there's a keyword for it. You know, instead, it's a mathematical concept, like you may have learned in discrete math or something like that, where you have a set of all the positive numbers, you know, that kind of stuff. And lastly, there's no output keyword. So this is not any specific syntax. This would not work in any programming language. Instead, it's just a general description that if you know the language, you can turn it into a solution. We're going to do that. I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to ask, okay, let's, let's describe what this is. Algorithm for converting C to F. And I know we all know what, you know, Celsius is, and we certainly don't use it in America, but 100 degrees Celsius is the boiling point, which is 212 in Fahrenheit. I'm just going to make a comment of that so that we can test our algorithms. So, by the way, you know, 100 degrees Celsius is 212 Fahrenheit, and... 0 degrees Celsius is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you probably remember that that's the freezing point of water, right? If the uh, weather's colder than that, there's going to be ice in the roads. Well, whoever invented Celsius decided that's 0 degrees, and that 100 degrees is a boiling point of water. Now, the person who invented Celsius was actually insane. No, I'm kidding. But they said that the hottest temperature was 0, and that the coldest temperature was 100, so they kind of flipped the scale, right? So as the number went up, the temperature got colder and colder. Well, that's ludicrous, so nobody actually did that, but they liked, scientists liked the idea of dividing it evenly into hundreds. Americans don't like doing that except for our money, right? You know, dollars and cents, but certainly our feet and our miles and inches and stuff like that are not evenly divisible by 100. Okay, so start. We're going to input C. That's enough, right? And then we are going to, there's a formula, which I may as well put up here, formula which is F is equal to C times 9 divided by 5 plus 32. Hope I get that right. I think I did. That's the formula for converting from Celsius to Fahrenheit. If I give you a conversion problem, I may give you the formula, or I may tell you to look it up. If I tell you to look it up, 
and you spend more than a few minutes at it, you don't know it, just text me. And I'll write it down and I'll send it back, right? This isn't a physics or a math class. I don't care if you memorize the formulas. I'll always give them to you, even if I don't type them down. But I'd like for y'all, you know, to at least have the experience of, of Googling and seeing if you can spot it. All right, we're going to input C, and then we're going to calculate F. So set F equal C times 9 divided by 5. Some people say 1.8. Same thing, right? Plus 32. And then output C. Excuse me, F. Stop. Now, if I was going to give this to a programmer, another programmer to do, I might want to specify a little bit more, right? Because what's missing from this is what the input C means, right? What, are we going to read that from... Uh, you know, a thermometer? Are we going to ask the user to type in a value? Are we going to open up a file and read it? Right? There, it, there's, no dis, there's no actual, you know, description of what, the, how we get that data. But we could give ourselves a clue and we could say output, quote, enter temperature in C. Something like that. Now we pretty much know that we're just going to be typing in, you know, displaying stuff on a screen and letting them type it in from the keyboard. The textbook, the first page on pseudocode, does not show an output statement there. All they show is this. Well, wrong slide. Input my number, set my answer to that, output my right. So we're, we're going a little bit beyond what they do because we want to describe further how to do the problem, how to solve the problem. And so where we say output F, we might want to give more information like output quote, the temperature in F is, end quote, comma, right. Now that's a really good description of the algorithm. We didn't have to do those, those output statements where we put the English stuff in it, because strictly speaking, you know, but it helps us. It helps us figure out how to write the program. And I'll give you an example of why. We're going to actually code this in Python next. So I'm going to type in three more double quotes, and I'm going to actually write some of that in Python. Let me scroll the text up so that we can see all this. Before I had these output statements, if we had written the program, it would have looked like this. C equals input. We would have to convert it into a number, just because in this particular language, and not in every language, Everything you type in is a string, right? It's a series of characters it's encoded in ASCII, right? Just like in a typewriter keyboard. And then we have to turn it into a number that the computer can understand. There has to be a conversion. So here, and I'm going to add a comment, C is equal to float, parentheses C. Convert string to a number. So we can do math on it. Now, when people start writing their, their own programs, I'm going to see, and don't type these things because these are wrong, I'm going to see commands like this. People are going to type that. Don't type that. People are going to type this. People are going to type this, right? Kind of like I have the idea, but you've got to get the syntax exactly right. So none of these are going to work. So when you're doing your homework and you get stuck, can you send me a picture of it so that I can help you out? You know, in the beginning, I'm going to see, you know, some people doing that. That doesn't mean you're dumb. It just means that you didn't have memorized the syntax exactly yet. Okay. And then we're going to output C. Well, there's no output command. Wait, we haven't solved the calculation yet. We have to do the math. So F is equal to C times 9 divided by 5 plus 32. I'm going to add a comment here. 
convert to Fahrenheit. And then lastly, print parentheses F. Right. That is what the pseudocode showed before I added these, you know, these strings here. Before I added that and before I added that, this is a, a precise transcription of that pseudocode into real code. Except we had to add a statement. And that's quite often the case, right? Because this is not a programming language. It doesn't care how, how you turn C into a number or if it already is or whatever. If I wrote this in C++, I wouldn't have to do this step. I have to do it in Java. No big deal. I just have to add it. But I'm going to have to remember that when I do an input statement and it's a number, I always have to follow it with that. I just have to remember that. Part of being a Python programmer is that when you have an input statement, you're going to convert it to a float or an int if you want a whole number, but we don't want a whole number. All right, now this should run, but it's not gonna run well. And what do I mean by that? It doesn't tell the user what to type. And it's also possible I made a syntax error. Lecture E. All right. So, you may have syntax errors. I'll wander around in just a second. All right, I ran it. Great. That's real cool, yo. <laughs> what are we supposed to do? Well, we know that we're supposed to type in a number, but that's because we have the source code sitting here in front of us. And so 100 degrees C is equal to 212 Fahrenheit. I'm going to type in 100, and we get 212. The user who ran this and it just sat there like that, they may have no idea what they're supposed to do. They may type in help, and it blows up. Why? We get an error message here that says, cannot convert string to a float. Well, that's true enough. That's not a number, so it cannot convert this string to a number. So that's why we put this in our pseudocode. Enter temperature and C. And that's why we put this, because we had no idea what that number 212 meant. So let's add both of those things. But if I give you some pseudocode for a problem, I might just put input C and then set F to the and then output F, right? I could do that, and then you would think to yourself, well, I need to tell the user to, you know, what to type in, and I need to tell you what the, uh, the answer is. So let's go ahead and do those things. We're going to output, so we're going to type in print, parentheses, quote, enter the temp, in C, end quote, in parentheses. That's better. It's not perfect because I'm still not telling them what the answer is, right? End of the temperature in C, 100, 212. You go, yeah, well, so what? I don't know what 212 means. So we're going to tell them. We're going to do this part of it as well. Print parentheses, quote, the temp in F is, end quote, comma. You see, I pretty much just followed that, except I put a print statement instead of the word output. And since Python requires it, I put parentheses around the whole thing. C zero because I know that zero is the freezing point of water which is 32 and F I'm testing out our algorithm and the temperature in F is 32 now this is a well done program yeah it could be better it could not blow up if somebody types in bad input that'd be nice you don't want your programs crashing it could loop so that they could convert multiple things in a row commonly what uh, fundamental students do is they want to test their program and so they type in a temperature in C and then they want to keep testing it. Well, it's not doing anything right. It's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. That's because it ran from the top to the bottom and that's all it did. There's no looping involved. I'll give you another example. People will run it and they'll get into an error state 
let me close this window and reopen it so that uh, the information is up at the top of the window. Right, I'm going to make a mistake. 100C. That's perfectly reasonable, right? The user may think that they can enter a, a temperature like that. Boom. It blows up. And I go, okay, okay. Right. But it's not working out, right? Because we are now just dumped straight into the shell. It's no longer an executing program. And so I will see that when y'all are wandering around. And again, it's not because you're dumb. It's, uh, you know, you're just building up experience that when you run a program and it crashes or whatever, it really is dead. We have to come back over here and run it again. Or if it reaches the end of the code, right? If it gets all the way down to here, then it's done. We have to rerun it. We can't just start typing in stuff into the shell and have it work. When we are converting pseudocode into real code, there's nothing wrong with putting a pound sign start and a pound sign stop, but it's not necessary, right? Those are just comments. However, if I ask you to write pseudocode, I do want you to put the start and the stop just because that's part of the standard and that's what the book shows. And pseudocode can look different depending on which author you ask about. Um, so pseudocode, I'm spelling it wrong, pseudocode examples. I'm just going to Google up a few. That one's not too bad. That one's not too far from, from our examples. Well, these are all pretty close to matching the standard. There's one. They use say rather than output. Instead of input, they use the word enter. I'm not going to count you off if you use the word say. I'm not going to count you off if you use the word print rather than output, right? Because print is what we do in our language. Everybody knows what print means. That's okay. That's okay. I'm not seeing the really weird one where uh, some people do this and don't type this. Um, they do this. F arrow arrow C times 9, you know, whatever. And they mean that to mean the same thing as set. The book certainly doesn't show that. I'm never going to mention it again. But if you see that, that's what that means. All right. I'm going to give you all some more pseudocode. But you all are going to turn it into the code based on this. Right, we have an example here. Wait, wait, first let me ask. Anybody need my eyeballs on your screen? Is it working? Not working. Speak now or forever hold your keyboard. I'm kidding, I'll come help you whenever you want. But it's better if we catch it early. All right, gonna do another bit of pseudocode. I'm gonna start a multi-line comment, so it's gonna be three quotes again. It could also be three apostrophes, but we'd have to end it with three apostrophes. Either one works. Start, output, enter the num of inches, question mark, end quote. And then input inches, centimeter, or excuse me, I should be following pseudocode, set centimeter equal inches times 2.54. I just tutored chemistry enough to have that memorized. If you ever took chemistry or physics, you probably do too. And then lastly, output centimeter, or better yet, output quote, that is, or the distance in centimeters is, space. Output quote, the distance in CM is end quote, comma, centimeters. And on the next line, stop. Give it a shot at converting this pseudocode into real code, just like we did up above. So see if you can type in a program after the uh, triple quotes. Just put it in the same file. 
So down here, right, go for it. Now fill in answer here. Now wander around. All righty, so what should the first line be? Yeah, that's cool. I may add the start comment above like I mentioned it, but that's the first command. Print, parentheses, quote, enter the number of inches, question mark, end quote, in parentheses. All righty, then what's next? Yeah, inches equals input and then a pair of parentheses. Inches equals input, parentheses, there, in parentheses. Space not necessary. Almost any time the spaces are not necessary. Right, I could remove that one. There's no super rhyme or reason when I add spaces or not, but I try to do it to make it easier to read for the folk in the back. All righty, next. What's the next line after inches? Inches again equals float, CN. Right. Inches equals float, parentheses, inches, end parentheses. That's the conversion. Nope, I'm going to do the conversion next, unless you were jumping ahead to the next line. So, yeah, CM is equal to inches times 2.54 and now I'm ready for my output except outputs not my keyword print is print parentheses quote the distance in centimeters is in quote comma cm yeah there we go and then stop now one problem with doing the pseudocode, if I put that start there, since we always started tabbing there, then people think that we're going to tab there. I kind of feel like not tabbing pseudocode as a result. I may start doing that. That This would be the first semester. And the books aren't going to show that. But I think I am. All right, one more example of pseudocode that I'm going to give. I don't think we're going to code it, but it's just going to be an if statement. So, triple, triple, tri or quote, 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 start, input age, if age less than 18, tab, output, quote, you can't vote yet, end quote, and then end if. I believe that's how the book shows ending an if statement. So we see that even if I don't tab after the start and, you know, between the start and the stop, you absolutely do have to tab after an if. The same is true if it's a loop, like a while, and that follows our code as well. Oh. See, I broke it by doing all this tabbing here. Let me undo that tabbing that's broken. Say you tab a whole bunch of stuff and you need to fix that. You can highlight all the lines and then you can choose format ddent. I love that term, ddent. There we go. Now it's good to go. I'm not going to code that in Python. I just wanted you to see an example where, where tabbing is absolutely necessary. And if I was going to follow the book's examples precisely, I would tab everything between start and stop. Either way, you're not going to get counted off. I've already explained why I've decided not to do that, and it's just because if you code it and you tab it, it would not work. Especially when we get to flow charting. My flow charting style is uh, quite a bit more precise than what the book shows, and I'm going to want you all to do it my way. 
Not that I'll count you off if you do it the book way, but I, I give some very precise recommendations. You say that if you code and you tab, it doesn't work? Exactly, exactly, because in this language, unlike some others, the tabs mean something very, very specific. And so if I tab this over, it's going to yell at me. Yeah, it says unexpected indent. That's just one, this language is one quirk. It's got like an easier syntax than most languages, but... You can't tab. Yeah, you can't tab except under certain circumstances. Like that one. You could tab there, and you could add tab after, you know. I'm going to type some examples. Don't type this unless you're going to make it a part of a comment. If x greater than 10 colon print. Wow. <laughs> While x is greater than 10, you know, x equals x minus 1. Those kind of examples, right? The only time that you tab is if on the line above it there's a colon. And that means that we have a block of code that only gets executed some of the time, like after if or after a while. And we'll learn what those mean later. I'm going to get rid of those for now. All right, let's just do one more code bit. Not going to necessarily do uh, the pseudocode and the code. Save time. So, let's square a number. Let's tell the user what they're typing in, even if it's just input x. So, print. I saw I typed the word input and then backspaced over it. Sorry. Print space. Print parentheses, quote, what is the value of x, question mark, end quote, in parentheses. Now we have to have our input, and then we have to convert it to a float. So pretty much in our pseudocode, anytime we see one word that says input, we know that there's going to be three Python statements. So, and then x equals input, parentheses, input, excuse me. X equals input, parentheses, close parentheses. We've got to convert it. X equals float, parentheses, X, end parentheses. And then X equals X. We could do this. X is equal to X times X, right? That's how you square something. But we could also use the exponent, which means star, star, 2. And if we were going to cube it, it'd be star, star, 3, right? If we are going to take it to the 10th power, it'd be star, star, 10. And now we're going to print x squared equals, end quote, comma, x. I guess I should make that a lowercase x, just to match it, all the other x's. Run it, see if there's any syntax errors here. I hope I still have the recording going. Yep. The problem is once we write a program that requires input, we have to type in input over and over and over every time we test it. But anyways, 10 squared is 100, so I'm happy with the way my program works. All right, let's see if we can knock out the rest of Chapter 1. I want to make sure that y'all got this going first. Anybody have syntax errors? I'd say come on, for if I don't have something to fix. Inches is not defined. That means that here we call it inches in a different spelling, uppercase. And then here we did something with uppercase i. This has to be precisely the same. I'll make a comment here that this isn't English, so we don't need to capitalize things. Like if you do, don't type this. If you type inches equals input, and then you do print 
parentheses quote and you put a lower or not. Anyways, if you do that, it's going to give you an error because that and that have to match exactly. So if you get a error message like, uh, let's find out what exactly what this says. It did work because I already had something called lowercase inches. Let's uh, pick a different one. Pounds, right? Because I want to, you know, I'm used to typing in the first language as being uh, the first letter being. Like I said, don't type this. It's going to be a syntax error. Okay. So, and it blows up. So if you see this error message, name pounds is not defined. We get a lot of information in this error message. It tells us what file it's in, it tells us what line it's on, and it gives us the error. Pounds is not defined. Now probably that's because we capitalized it up above or we made some typo, right? Well, it sure would be nice if down the side of the editing window it showed the line numbers. And some editors do that. This one doesn't, so we just have to kind of figure out where line 75 is. Not too hard. If you look down in the corner, it says line 64, column 0. You can use that to figure out where line 75 is. So I'm just going to keep hitting the down button until I find line number 75. And I go, oh, that's the, line, that's the error, you know, and then hopefully I can spot it past that point. You will get better and better at debugging, at interpreting what those error messages mean and how to find the spot in the code that they correspond to. Looking at question. Sorry. Yeah. Looking at our script, we're redefining x at each line, right? The variable x. That's correct. And we've already done that here. It's okay to reuse a variable name like that. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, real quick, what is what is float again? What is float? Float means uh, a number with a that supports a decimal point. Okay. Right. If I type this in, y is equal to 3, the language decides that that's an integer. But if I type in y is equal to 3.0, the language decide, decides that that's a float. In this language, it doesn't much matter. It will convert from one to the other cleanly. But in other languages, you have to define what, yep, you have to type like that, and you have to type that. And if you tried to set this, it would either round it down or be a syntax error. Right. Yeah. Very good question. All right, so pseudocode standards. Programs begin with the word start, end with the word stop. Those words should be aligned. If there's a module name used, eh, it's followed by a set of parentheses. We, we don't have modules yet. By the way, modules are synonymous with the term functions in other programming languages. I will often use the word functions because that's the term that's used in the vast majority of languages, and that's what I get, that's what I teach. But and then I'll swap it in, you know, in my speaking. Here we're using a function, I mean module, because the book is using this term. If I could go through and search and replace every use of the word module with the word function, that'd be great, but I, I can't do that for the textbook. So, Each program statement performs one action, input, processing, or output. So, pseudocode would not be things like convert F to C and KG to pounds, right? Those are two different functions. We're supposed to put those on two different lines. We would not put input F and KG, right? Because that's two different things. We'd want a separate, each line should perform one task. Even if later on we find out that that one task actually is full, uh, three commands of coding but that's dependent upon the language. 
we could actually do this in one line of code. I'm going to show you how to do that, and then I'm going to comment it out. Here's how you could do these three lines of code in one line of code. And it's kind of fraught with peril, usually, uh, uh, not really, but if you don't put the right number of parentheses in it, then it doesn't work. You get a syntax error. X equals input parentheses. Wait, 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 backspace. X, see what I mean? X equals float parentheses input parentheses quote. What is the value of X question mark? End quote, in parentheses, in parentheses, like that. That is a replacement for that. We can do that. I think it's harder to type. I go ahead and break it out into three statements. If you like cramming as much code on, on the screen at one time as possible, then you can do that. I'll just put this as a comment. You could do the first three steps in one line of code as shown. You're not going to see me do this as an example very often. You will see me do this though. I could do this. This is, this is legit, I think. This is cool. Input parentheses quote, what is the value of x question mark end parentheses, excuse me, end quote, end parentheses, and then on the next line, x equals float x. Now we did these three lines of code and two lines of code. I think that's cool enough, right, because we don't have to worry about the number of closing parentheses and stuff. The syntax isn't quite, you know, it's torturous to type. We could type this in cleanly and it would work. We wouldn't make any mistakes. All this says is that if you put something in between the parentheses of an input statement, it prints it out. It's just a shortcut. And so I'll be doing that sometimes. The reason I steer away from that is because if we flow chart, which we're going to do, this code, we would need to break this into two lines of code. We would need to have the print on one line, and we would need the input on the other. And so if we had it like this, then it's easy to remember to do that in the flow chart. But if we have it like this, not so easy. Not that hard, right? You just have to remember to put two boxes on the flow chart for one line of code. So another comment. Or you can do this. I'm not going to get through chapter one. So program statements are indented a few spaces more than the word stop, or the module name. I told you I'm going to start skipping that on start stop, I think, but the book won't. Each program statement appears on a single line. If you need to, you can make it longer than that and indent it, right? So if I was going to write some pseudocode here, you know, Input x as, you know, I don't necessarily type that, blah, 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 and then I need to go to the next line, I could just indent it, right? Blah, 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 right, yeah. And you would know that that's the part of the prior line. I'm going to try very hard to never have a line of code that's more than one screen wide. Program statements begin with lowercase letters. No punctuation. We don't need to put periods at the end of statements. Flowcharts. I'm going to skip flowcharts. That's next lecture. Or something like that. We can create loops. We will learn how to create loops. If you do create loops, you have to avoid infinite loops. An infinite loop is when the program enters a state where it's just repeating logic over and over and never stops. give an example of an infinite loop in our code, but then we're going to delete it or comment it out so you don't have to do this. I'm tired of having to answer all those questions, so I'm going to put this up at the very top of the code. I'm going to come up way up here above my comments for the very first pseudocode, just to, so I don't have to type all that stuff in, right? x equals 1, while x equals equals 1, colon, print, hello, 
This is bad programming. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's good programming. Maybe that's exactly what you wanted it to do, but probably not. That's called an infinite loop, right? It's running forever. Not really forever. You just have to stop the code. You can stop the code by hitting either Control C or just hitting the close window, right? The close X. Now I'm going to delete that. I just wanted you to see an infinite loop because the book mentioned it. I don't mind stopping there and going on to the homework. This is actually a good place to stop. All right, so I had one homework assignment queued up, but I'm going to tack on something else to it. Let me get into D2L. Let's do one more example in code before I show you the homework. But I think I'm going to do it up at the top, like I said, because I'm tired of having to enter all those things. So how about this? A equals input. Enter A. Colon. End quote in parentheses. And the colon is just for fun. It's just a display. It's not actually part of the syntax because it's inside the quote. But we do have to convert it. A equals float parentheses A. Now let's ask the user for a second value. B equals input parentheses quote enter B colon end parentheses end quote. And on the next line, B equals float B. And now we're going to do an equation. Result, or R, I'm just going to go with the word result, equals A star star B. And now I'm going to print that. Print, parentheses, quote, A star star B is, in parentheses, oops, whoops, I said that wrong. Print parentheses quote a star star b is end quote comma result in parentheses. Now let's let's make sure that I didn't get any syntax errors. Enter a ten, enter b two. So I'm going to take ten to the power of two. A star star b is equal to one hundred. That's correct. Now why did I show you that? Because I wanted to make sure you had the idea that we could ask for more than one value, because that's what the homework is going to do. No, I never do that. It'll be due uh, next Sunday. I always give you a week. So, write a program that will ask the user for the values of x and the value of y. Then have the program calculate the following values and print the results of each calculation. x times y, x divided by y, x plus y, and x minus y. I like my grade school time, uh, terminology. Times and minus and um, plus rather than add and subtract and stuff like that. I like minus better than subtract because if you say x subtracted from y, right, then you have to swap them, right? It's really y minus x. Anyways, so that's your, your uh, homework, and now I'm going to tack something onto it, which is write pseudocode to create an algorithm. And you don't have to type this stuff in. This is going to be uploaded, right? For converting kilograms to pounds. The formula is 
pounds equals kilograms divided by 2.206, I believe. That's pretty close. If you feel like actually getting it more precise than that, great. So this is part one, is to write a program. And then part two, write the pseudocode. And you can just put them in the same file, right? You can just put this stuff in comments. specifically involve this. And if you feel like coding this as well, you could code it, but I'm going to grade based on whether there's pseudocode in it or not. So don't write Python code, not do the pseudocode and expect 100 on it. I would just say, do the pseudocode as well and ask you to turn it in again. All right, that homework makes sense, guys. Do you want to just put this in the Dropbox? Um, what we just did, we need to make a Dropbox for it. Yes, absolutely. I will do that right now. Thank you. I should have had that ready for you already. So this would be Dropbox D. Something's looking weird there. This is the uh, fifth class. Is it not? No, because we didn't have that in Monday class. Got it. So this was actually Lecture D, and I told you to have the wrong name for it. All right. Sorry about that, guys. So this is homework D, not homework D, in class D, which was pseudocode and conversions. If you feel like renaming your file to D, that'd be great. I'm going to do a save as and do that myself. File, save as, and call it lecture D. You don't got it. When I give homework assignments in class, they always go to D2L. Yeah. Anybody doing the practice things in, in uh, D2L even though they're not for a grade? Well, that's cool. Right, right, yeah. Well, that's cool. You earn esteem points for that. That's cool. That's cool. All righty, gang. I will see you all on Wednesday. Where do we find the homework? I will create a Dropbox, and the homework will be part of it. So I will do that right now.